today, I'm uh, going to speak, uh, uh, I, I, as I've grown older, I like to slam dunk Stuart a little bit, because, uh, but I'm going to speak with him uh, on something when he's at one of his high points, and it kind of hurts me to slam dunk him in other talks I give, because he's the one that got me interested in the Civil War uh, when I was in the seventh grade, uh, when my father who was a World War I veteran, liked to read World War I vet, uh, books to myself and my brother. And uh, one time he happened to read John Thomason's book, Je Jeb Stewart. I think he acquired the book thinking it was probably a World War I because Thompson was a Marine in World War I, and except for Jeb Stewart and a novel on the Civil War, all his writings were either on the Marine Corps or World War I. Now to look at uh, Jeb Stuart and his ride around McClellan. Uh, to turn back a little bit before the ride around McClellan, uh, we would focus on the first day of June, 1862. On that day, uh, the Robert E. Lee, who had been advisor to uh, President Jefferson Davis, since his recall from uh, overseeing coastal defenses in the southeast United States uh, is called to take command of the Army of Northern Virginia, as he will make it famous. Uh, the Army was somewhat disgruntled. It was somewhat battered. It had sorted forth on the 31st day of May. It had seen its commanding officer uh, Joseph E. Johnston wounded and had not performed particularly well after a good start. In fact, Douglas Southall Freeman, who generally can say nothing bad about any Virginians, uh, <laughs> titles his chapter uh, in, in the Lee's Lieutenants, refers to the uh, Battle of the S Seven Pines, or if you're a good Yankee, Fair Oaks, as the worst planned battle fought by what uh, becomes the North Bat Army of Northern Virginia. So Lee, as a pullback in, uh, Stuart at this time is chief of cavalry in the army. Uh, he commands a brigade of cavalry, and he knows Lee from before. He has he was a cadet at West Point when Robert E. Lee was superintendent. Undoubtedly, he got to he got to know Lee even better. Uh, on the period between the on the 17th and 18th day of October 1859 at Harper's Ferry when uh, they had their date with destiny and John Brown. Uh, so, uh, so Stuart will write Lee a letter. Presumes uh, quite a bit for a uh, brigadier general. Uh, addressing on the 5th of June, uh, excuse me, the 4th of June, a letter to Robert E. Lee, who had established his headquarters on Nine Mile Road up at the, at the Mary Dabbs house. Uh, the tenor of uh, Stuart's advice to General Lee is that uh, they, the Confederate Army should take the offensive, uh, and when they take the offensive, uh, they should strike the Union forces uh, south of the Chickahominy, uh, where the majority of the Union forces, following the Battle of Seven Pines, are now grouped. Uh, he will give Lee this advice. Uh, Lee will, uh, uh, does not respond, takes it into consideration, uh, but Lee is thinking of a different uh, strategy. Uh, his uh, plan is to take advantage of the successes scored by Jackson up in the valley uh, uh, that culminate on uh, the 8th and the 9th of June with the battles of Cross Keys and Port Republic. What Lee is thinking about is uh, the possibility of smiting the Union forces north of the Chickahominy, uh, the, uh, that is, the force north of the Chickahominy at this time is being reduced as General Franklin's Sixth Corps is being transferred south of the Chickahominy uh, to join the, uh, to join Kaiser's Fourth Corps 
uh, Sumner's 2nd Corps and Heintzelman's 3rd Corps, leaving just the 5th Corps north of the Chickahominy. And at this time, the 5th Corps only consists of the two, divi of two divisions. Uh, the division of McCall, the Pennsylvania Reserves, have not yet arrived at White House Landing. They will arrive at White House Landing just uh, uh, two days before Stuart moves out on his ride around McClellan. So, uh, as, uh, as linked to Matura's plans, uh, Lee uh, again contacts Stuart, uh, Stuart on the 10th of June, and this time he has a mission for his chief of cavalry. The chief of cavalry is to take out his, uh, a picked force. Uh, he is to uh, move, uh, he is to make a reconnaissance, a uh, forced reconnaissance, and he is to move down the watershed between the Pamunkey and the Chickahominy River and see uh, if McClellan's right is anchored on a strong barrier. Is it anchored on the South Anna? Is it anchored on the Pamunkey River of which the South Anna and the North Anna form? He is also to see if the Union are using the piping, uh, piping Spring Road as a line of supply from White House Landing to supply the Army's right north of the Chickahominy. He is to drive in herds of cattle and other livestock that he might observe. He is to be cautious. Uh, he is not to bring on a major engagement, and he is to be and he is to be careful and conserve his men and horses. He is to be. Uh, he is not to seek out an engagement in which he might lose uh, lose his cherished horses and men. Lee's word is cherished your men and horses, is actual words he uses. Uh, so Stuart has his mission. Now let us, uh, Stuart, most of Stuart's cavalry at this time is camped near the Richmond Fairgrounds, which would be north of the city and to, near uh, Brook Road. Stuart himself maintains his headquarters at Mrs. Mordecai's, uh, near the railroad and the uh, and Kibbe, Kibbe Station. Now, as Stuart looks at his mission, he will select the man he will take with him. His force, when it takes the field, will consist of approximately 1,200 officers and men. He will take the 1st Virginia Cavalry, uh, commanded by Fitz, Colonel Fitzhugh Lee, a nephew of the uh, of Robert E. Lee. Uh, Fitzhugh Lee is a graduate of West Point. Uh, he is four years younger than Jeff Stewart, who at this time is 29 years old. So he will take uh, Fitzhugh Lee and the 1st Virginia. Uh, he will then choose to take the 9th Virginia, commanded by Rooney Lee, Robert E. Lee's second son, Robert e. Lee, uh, Rooney Lee is, uh, commands the 9th Virginia, and Rooney is not a West Point graduate. He is a graduate of Harvard. Uh, he will then take with him four, uh, six companies of the, of the, of the sixth, of the 4th Virginia Cavalry, commanded by uh, William Wickham. William, William Wickham will not be with him. Uh, Colonel Wickham had been wounded at the Battle of, uh, of Williamsburg on the 5th of, of May, and at this time was recovering at the home of, of uh, at, at his parents' home, Hickory Hill, just south of the South Anna River. Hickory, uh, also, Rooney <coughs> Lee happens to be married uh, to Charlotte Wickham, uh, who, of course, is William's uh, sister. He will take with him uh, uh, four companies of the Jeff Davis Legion, uh, commanded by Will Martin. Born in Kentucky, Martin has been a longtime Mississippian, and he is a graybeard compared to Stuart and the two Lees. 
being 39 years old and being a planner and a lawyer uh, from Adams County. Two guns commanded by Breathitt will, go, will, will fill out the artillery. One a 12-pounder howitzer, the other a 12-pounder rifle Blakely of British, of British manufacture. So this is the force he will take with him and on the evening, uh, on, the, on the 11th, orders go out to the people to get ready to mark, to ride the ne early the next morning. They will, the men will carry 60 rounds of ammunition and three days ration. Uh, they'll only take, the winnow, the officers will winnow out the men who have less stamina and the horses of less, uh, uh, that may give uh, appearance of breaking down early. So on the, on the morning of the 12th, at two o'clock in the morning, Stuart awakes and set, tells his staff officers to horse, and within 10 minutes, Stuart and his staff are mounted, and they proceed out to the, uh, out to the camp of the troops at the fairgrounds. The commands are soon turned out, and they will they mount up, and in column of fours, uh, they start north up the Brook Turnpike. Near where the Brook Turnpike joins the Telegraph Road, Stuart will pass. They will pass a rather seedy-looking tavern, Yellow Tavern. They will not uh, undoubtedly Stuart will not realize the significance of Yellow Tavern at this time. There they turn into the mountain road. He is not shared with the rank and file where they're going, and since the mountain road, principally the alignment of today's three, uh, uh, Highway 33, it goes up to Louisa Courthouse and then on, to, uh, on across the Blue Ridge Mountains at Swift Run Gap. So the people who are not in the know all speculate that they're en route to the valley to help old Jack drive the Yankees acro back across the, uh, uh, the Potomac River. So they will head on up the mountain road across the, uh, the RF&P Railroad and uh, about three or four miles beyond the RF&P Railroad, they will turn right into Hughes Road that carries them north and east and up toward the north of uh, the South Anna. It has been raining fairly heavily uh, in the days preceding. As you remember, there had been a terrible rainstorm on the night of the 30th and the 31st of May. So the north, at the, the north and the South Anna are very, very high. After a ride of 22 miles, uh, of course, when they have turned east, uh, following the south side of the South Anna, uh, the light bulbs begin going on uh, as, they, as the, even the dumbest private realizes that they have now, they're not going to the valley. They have now turned and are moving eastward uh, toward the uh, toward White House Landing and toward uh, the flank of George B. McClellan's mighty army. The, after a 22-mile ride, they will halt uh, shortly after crossing uh, the, uh, the RF&P Railroad, uh, and the troopers will go will on saddle their horses and then go and camp on the fields of the Winton Plantation uh, just south of the north of the South Anna River. Stuart and Rooney Lee decide to go visit uh, Colonel Williams Wickham, who is recovering at Hickory Hill. So while the other people bet down, Stuart and Williams Wickham, uh, Stuart and Rooney Lee ride to Hickory Hill, five miles Hickory Hill, uh, while uh, Rooney Lee uh, visits his uh, uh, visits. Uh, his wife, uh, sees his wife and his in-laws. Uh, Stuart talk, passes a few remarks with Colonel Wickham and then dozes in a chair. 
long before daybreak on the 13th, uh, Stuart and, and Rooney Lee rouse themselves right back to the camp, and there will be no sounding of bugles this morning, and a signal that the march will begin. Several rockets are fired into the air, and the column moves out, taking the road that leads ever eastward uh, to intercept the uh, Richmond Stage Road, uh, so, a short distance east of where the troopers cross the uh, the Virginia the, the Virginia Central Railroad. The area through which they're riding, off to the left, is a area along the uh, the South Anna. And as they approach the Pamunkey, uh, you have the great plantation houses on the high ground, looking up, looking northward uh, toward the river. Uh, you have the corn is about knee high, the wheat a little shorter in the fields as they cross the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the RF the Virginia Central Railroad. Now let us see what the Yankees are doing and who should be looking out for them. The man, there are two men who are responsible for the Union cavalry guarding the Union right. One of them is uh, Philip St. George Cook. He is 54 years old. He is uh, Jeff Stewart's father-in-law. Uh, he has seen Jeff Stewart cast his lot with the South and he has seen his son, John, join the, uh, join the Confederate Army. Uh, Stuart, when uh, uh, Colonel Cook, a Virginian, uh, remained loyal to the Union, uh, Stuart is reputed to have said, you will regret your decision once all your life. And I can promise you before the next two days are over, uh, uh, Philip St. George Cook will be regretting his decision uh, because he is going to uh, be in uh, the next two days are going to have a couple of very important Union officers looking for his scalp, particularly Fitz John Porter. Will not be impressed with Cook's performance there and we'll learn tomorrow at, at Gaines Mill he's going to get it in even further for Philip St. George Cook and he will soon be leaving the army. The other cavalry commander is a member of that star-studded class of 1846, a class made of Stonewall Jackson, George Stoneman. George Stoneman has, has his headquarters in the Mechanicsville area, and he is, he is, his orders are every day to send a patrol up the Richmond Stage Road that's in essence today Highway 2 uh, to, to uh, Hanover Courthouse. And commanding uh, at the other, and Phelps St. George Cook, he has his headquarters at Gaines Mill. Now on the 31st day of May, uh, Phelps St. George Cook has sent Captain William Royal. William Royal has moved with, to, with four companies of cavalry and has taken position at Old Church. His tasks are daily send a patrol west along the road to Hanover Courthouse, and where they will check in with the patrol from Stoneman's and note if there are any Confederate activity. He also has to patrol the crossings of the Pamunkey River. So these are the men that are going to be moving in. Now let us see what type of Union infantry is in the area. Just arrived from, from Northern Virginia, disembarking at White House Landing is a division we will hear a lot about tomorrow. That's the division of Pennsylvania Reserves commanded by George McCall. George McCall's men on going ashore at White House Landing are in train. Now it's important to remember McClellan's lifeline, his umbilical cord, is the, is the West Point and Richmond Railroad that runs from White House Landing to Savage's Station. The Union have even brought down locomotives and car rolling stock to put on this railroad. Because they unload there and then forward to the 
supply depot for the troops south of the Chickahominy is Savage's Station. The supply depot for the troops north of the Chickahominy, the railroad uh, supply depot, is at Dispatch Station. At Dispatch Station is a man that if you're Yankees, you're going to say, I have a talk on this one, that the best thing if you're a senior general is to get killed in the war because your brother officers never speak ill of a man killed in battle. One the Yankees have is John Fulton Reynolds. And I have a long talk to say he's, I don't think he's as good as his reputation. But he is in command. We'll, it happen. we'll let you all be right. And he is the greatest thing since bread. He is commanding the Union forces at the Spatch Station. The next big infantry force is George Sykes. Sykes has a division. Sykes is posted as his headquarters near New Bridge. His mobile force is a brigade of New Yorkers commanded by one of the heroes of Gettysburg, Grosvenor Kimball Warren. This is before while Warren was an infantryman and before he became an engineer. He probably, as events would show later in the war, he should have stayed an engineer, chief engineer, rather than uh, uh, accepting a challenge as a corps commander. So these are the Union forces Stuart is going to have to worry about. <laughs> also, you have a small Union force at White House Landing. This is commanded by Colonel Ingalls. It's G it has gunboats to call on, it has a battery artillery, it has a, a regiment of cavalry, the 11th Pennsylvania. So Stuart, at 9 o'clock, turns into the stage road. The day US 1, US 2, and starts southward for Hanover Courthouse. Stuart has with him, as I like to say, on his staff, he has lots of interesting people. He has a man that writes in the vernacular of Walter Scott, John Eston Cook. <laughs> John Eston Cook has a good description of as they approach Hanover Courthouse, looking southward at the courthouse uh, where Patrick Henry uh, uh, conducted the preacher's case, and across from it, its ancient tavern. Incidentally, though, if you take a tour, those structures are still there. As they, uh, as Stuart approaches, he sees bluebirds in town, as they refer to the Yankee cavalry. This is the 150-man patrol that General Stoneman has sent north from Mechanicsville. Stuart decides to bank. He tells Fitz Lee, Take the 1st Virginia Cavalry, swing to the west, and establish a roadblock south of Hanover Courthouse and, Atlee, and between it and Atlee Station. Stuart waits a while, becomes concerned. Lee has off to the west of the stage road, that is now is a water course and it is quite wobby. Lee has been encumbered in the swamp and delayed. And Stuart thunders forward with Knight Virginia, Captain William Robbins. You like to survive and write about it because you can always make yourself the hero of an expedition. So Robbins of the Ninth Virginia has the lead. They'll thunder forward, the Union will pull out of town, and there is no roadblock. And Stoneman's men escape, except for one unfortunate sergeant who is captured. At the same time as Stuart thunders southward, the men of the 4th U.S. Cavalry Skedaddling ahead of them, coming in from the east, is the other patrol. Remember, two patrols a day. One from the south out of Stoneman's command, one from the west 
out of Royal's command. The man that has drawn Royal's task that day is Edward Laib. Edward Laib, commander of Company F, 5th U.S. Cavalry, and the old army, that was the 2nd U.S. Cavalry. Fitz Lee served in the 2nd U.S. Cavalry. So the senior sergeants are all going to know Fitzhugh Lee. So Lee's men ride west across the Totopotomy, past Orange Jock, past Eon Church. And as they approach the stage road, they see rebels. At first, they thought they might be fellow bluebirds, till they came closer. Lave and six men had worked ahead. They now recognize each other, and Lave gallops back, joins his men, and they head for Hawes shot. Him, he's sending a courier to alert Royal that a force of Confederates of about a squadron strength is a foot. <clears throat> Stuart takes the shortcut. He turns his men. You can't drive this road anymore. You have to walk it by Tolliver's Mill. And they come in at Eon Church on the old church road, main old church, Hanover Courthouse Road. And as they push westward, excuse me, eastward, toward Hawes Shop, they are sighted by Captain Laib. Excuse me, Lieutenant Laib. Laib, uh, Let's just pick it, pulls back, sends another messenger spurring to headquarters at Old Church. Royal, when he receives this message, calls for Lieutenant McLean, tells him to go to the support of Labe with Company H. And they head west. As Stuart's cavalry presses on, Captain Robbins, he lives to write about it, lives a long time, writes for battles and leaders. He's out in front. <laughs> Beyond Hawes' shop, they began to drop away into the, into the Totopotomy. Lane has now been joined by McLean, and the Union forces deploy. Stuart comes up to Robbins and orders Robbins' squadron to charge boot to spur. The Yankees will say, the reason we don't do as well as we should, we have pistols and swords. They have pistols, excuse me, they have swords, carbines, and rifle muskets which give the rebels the bulge in range. Well, the first clash takes place. First west of the Totopotomy, then they drive the Yankees across the Totopotomy, and the Yankees go back across it so fast they don't pull up any of the planks. And on the other side, a second charge sends the two Union companies, <coughs> Gadatling, back to Lin Linney's Crossing. Linney's is where the old church, Hanover Courthouse Road, crosses the Mechanicsville <coughs> Tabahannock Road. That's 460 today, 360 today. There they're joined by her, uh, Cap Captain Royal with Captain Burns' squadron, company. Burns, he, they really don't hold against Burns, because he's going to end up commanding the Irish Brigade and get killed at Petersburg on 17th of June. Because he's going to be, if you wanted to go after one of the guys, if Cook wanted to go after somebody, 
That's who he should have gone after for some of his bad decisions, decision making. So, the three companies of Union Cavalry take position just west of Lindy. Stewart comes up, 9th Virginia still out in front. Robin's men dismount and deploy left and right of the road. And Captain Lackney, squadron of the ninth, now makes their celebrated charge that, that, that will live in history, particularly in paintings that appear throughout the South. After William Washington does his painting and John Thompson writes his poem. They charge in against the Union forces. Latney and Royal square off. Latney uses his saber. Royal uses his pistol. And Latney is no more. <laughs> As they say, he fell on his what he fell on his back with his feet to the enemy. Royal is wounded. Royal will go on to a long career. People interested in Indian Wars, he'll be commanding the 3rd Cavalry at the Rosebud eight days before the Little Bighorn. Fortunately, he's not with Custer. <laughs> of course, he's in the 3rd Cavalry, commanding the 3rd Cavalry, not the 7th. Injured, he falls back, and the Union Cavalry falls back on Old Church. Meanwhile, messages have galloped to Colonel Cook's headquarters. Colonel Cook's headquarters at Gaines Mill. And he orders out the horse, all the horse sound. Out goes Colonel Williams with the remainder of the 5th and 6th U.S. Cavalry, moving northward to Bethesda Church, then turning into the road that goes out toward Tabahannock. Turning out also is this interesting regiment made up of the Philadelphia elite. Russia's 6th Pennsylvania. Russia's Lancers. And they still have their lances at this time. As well as the 1st Cavalry. Now comes the message. In the skirmish at Linney's, Captain Lieutenant Burns thinks he has seen six, five or six regiments of rebel infantry. Five or six regiments of rebel infantry, at least 3,000. When that message hits Colonel Cook, he becomes very, very conservative. When that hits General Porter, Porter orders General Warren, Excuse me, Colonel Warren, take your infantry and move to the support of the cavalry. The cavalry is, uh, Williams then says, excuse me, Emory then says, Colonel William Emory, we haven't got any ration. We we'll have to wait to send back to the wagons. They procrastinate. <clears throat> By 10 o'clock p.m., they reach Linney. And they don't advance beyond Lenny's till the infantry comes up. Because of the fear that they are four to five thousand rebel infantry. Well, at midnight at Lenny's, this is midnight on the 13th. Stuart is a long, long way from there. After the clash at Lenny's, after Latney's brother has taken Latney's body, to the Newton and the Broken Brawl Bro Plantation for the burial the next day on the 14th, Stuart proceeds on. Fitz Lee is delighted. He sees a couple of men. He recognizes Union prisoners, NCOs from his old command, 2nd U.S. Cavalry. He finds out from them their camp at Old Church. So Lee will go to Stuart and solicit from Stuart 
the opportunity to pay his old unit a visit. He takes the lead now. Thunders down on old church. The camp is just south of the church. The Union cavalry are skedaddling for Gaines Mill, and they leave behind clothes, whiskey, all their camp gear. Stuart now that arrived. Now Stuart makes his decision. And in retrospect, perhaps he shouldn't have made this decision, because it'll encourage him to make some decisions later on that ain't very good. <laughs> he he had been cautioned by Lee when he had broached the subject of riding around McClellan's army. Lee had cautioned him against it, told him to cherish his men and horses. Now when he has reached Old Church, Stuart reasons, and he goes into great detail on his reasoning. Of course, his re this is post ex post facto his reasoning, because he writes his after action report later. His reasoning is, it's 17 miles back to Hanover Courthouse. The Yankees are bound to be at the Totopotomy Bridge. If not there, they will expect him to go back. If he goes on, he'll be doing the unexpected, and they won't be looking for him. Equally important, he can strike the juggler vein used to supply the Union Army at Tunstall Station. And perhaps, if fortune smiles, he can raid the great supply depot. He now calls in his ranking officers, tells him what he's going to do, and again, in his after action report, after the fact, says that they weren't that overjoyed, but he prevailed. And in early afternoon, the, in mid, late afternoon, the column moves out, taking the old church, old church, this uh, Tunstall Station Road, paralleling the Pamunkey River. Off to the left, they can see the great fields as they sweep from the manor houses down to the Bonkey, to the right, they can see in a distance on, on when they come across high ground Union camps. Where there's where there are mud holes, they can see this heavy traffic, wagon traffic. They cut off and capture several wagons. As they approach dispatch Tunstall Station, late about five o'clock. They see the road veering off to the left to Gerlach's Landing. And Stuart calls for Captain Knight. Two, four squadrons. Excuse me, two squadrons. One from 1st, one from 9th Virginia. Go to Gerlach's Landing. They thunder down to Gerlach's Landing. Tied up there are three scooters. There are supply wagons from the 44th and 17th New York, guarded by small details, and a detail with wagons from the 1st U.S. Cavalry. They disperse the Yankee guards, burn two of the boats, one boat casts loose its fast and dro drops downstream, and soon a pyre of smoke is rising over Gerlach's landing. Stewart, meanwhile, is approaching Tunstall Station. Out in front, Robbins again, traveling with him, Will Farley, John S. Mosby, and others. And they'll cut the telegraph. A couple of men from the 11th U.S. Cavalry see them coming. They panic and flee by Tunstall Station, shouting, the devil's to pay, the devil's to pay, and the troops wonder what it is. Moments <laughs> later, <laughs> thundering down are the rebels. Just as they reach it and begin to pry up a rail, 
Choof, choof, choof. They hear a locomotive. Upbound. They throw a couple of ties across the track. The engineer puts on the steam, pulls back the throttle, and it pushes the cow catcher, pushes the ties out of the way, and it rumbles back by, heading for White House Landing. Will Farley, mounted on a horse, rides alongside, shoots the engineer. The fireman takes the throttle, and the engine and its cars escape. They now round up Yankees, prisoners, they burn the bridge across, the railroad bridge across Black Creek. Burn the depot. And just as it gets dark on the night of the 13th, the column moves on. Heading south and east. Stuart toyed momentarily with heading for White House Landing. But he rejected it. Fortunately, he did. Because the locomotive has arrived. The gunboats cast loose their guns, training them on the approaches to the landing. Union artillery takes position, and the quartermaster troops turn out. Stuart pushes on. The terrible, it's a long, hard night. Past St. Peter's Church, where Martha Dandridge had attended, before she became a Custis. On to Tallyville, which they arrive at about 11 o'clock. Swoop down, capture a sutler store. Godly the Yankee soldiers, probably glad to see him capture the sutlers, <laughs> because the sutlers were notoriously at gouging the troops. They rest there for a while. Now remember, this is around midnight. Warren and Cook are still at Linney's. Stuart now pushes south, crosses the, and as he heads southward, how are they going to get across the Chickahama? Private Frazier from New Kent County is guiding him. He's familiar with every road in the area. As they approach the Chickahominy, they know that Forge Bridge has been destroyed. They know the Chickahominy is high. Lieutenant Christian comes to Stuart and says, Papa lives in the area. Why don't we cross at his ford, Sycamore Ford? Dort says, good. So after leaving Providence Forge, the column turns in the road to Sycamore Forge. They reach there, and it's higher than it's ever Christian notices, higher than he's ever seen it before. Rudy Lee, powerful man, good swimmer. He will leap into the river and swim across, taking a line across. And they will attempt to cross. Time is passing. After a hundred men have crossed, Stuart can see the Yankees are ready. They're going to be back. Because already, General John Fulton Reynolds and his brigade have been shifted from dispatch station to Tunstall Station by rail. Warren and Cook are marching through Old Church. The, Pennsyl the, Russia's, the Pennsylvania Lancers, commanded by a real, genuine Philadelphia aristocrat, Robert Morris, from the family dates back to the Revolution, a man who loses his life at Brandy Station have forged out in front. The Confederates, so Rudy and his hundred men, move downstream. And the Confederates on the north bank with Stuart move downstream. At the Forge Bridge, there's an island. The river is in two channels. They can see the abutments from the old bridge on the north channel. Nearby is a 
cotton gin. Cotton gins have large, like a large support. So Redmond Burke is put to work with the detail, dismantling the gin. They find that the law, the supports are just long enough to reach from one abutment to the other. So they position the abutments, then lay the planks, and they begin to slowly cross the bridge onto the island. On the other side, they put a small boat out, resting pl planks, and are crossing. About, 10 about, about noon on the 14th, thundering down just as the last of them have crossed. And guess who's the last one to cross? William Robbins. <laughs> the advantage of living law. <laughs> right. As, they, as, they, as he is preparing to depart, up rides Major Morris with his detachment. Shots are exchanged, and the feds abandon the pursuit. Stuart proceeds to Lieutenant Christian's father's house, spends the afternoon there. On the 14th, late afternoon, Tom heads on to Charles City Courthouse. Where they halt. Lee, Jack uh, Stort will now turn the command over to Fitz Lee. And accompanied by two staffers, he will ride to Richmond. They're not through clear yet, they're not clear yet. Because Union gunboats patrol the James River from City Point out. They dread. The gunboats will open fire on River Road. Or will McClellan galvanize himself into action and throw Fighting Joe Hooker's division across White Oak Swamp intercept? They don't do that. And all, early on the morning of the 15th, Stuart arrives in Richmond to report first to Governor Letcher, then to Robert E. Lee. The rest of the expedition comes in. A very successful expedition. They've ridden around McClellan's army. Fortunately, McClellan did not realize import of what had just happened. Stuart's father-in-law is not popular, <laughs> as you can imagine, with Warren's infantry. Warren will complain about his infantry having to keep up with the cavalry because the cavalry will not go anywhere without them in support. <coughs> so we have Stuart's first great ride around the Union Army. As we know, he will do it again at Chambersburg in mid-October 1862 and then he will do it again in June 1863 with not such good results. Looks like uh, I have now talked my length of time and I'm ready for the rest of the allotment for questions. Any questions? Did the uh the orders to bring back cattle or uh, wagons ever amount to anything? Was he able to do it? Uh, he, he sent some back on day one on the 12th, some wagons and cattle. But after, on the 13th, from the, from the 13th on, he's take, just bringing prisoners along and horses and mules that he's captured. He's not bringing any wagons. He does not glom on any wagons. And in fact, he's a little disgusted because he loses, he has to abandon a, a limber when he crosses the uh, Chicago River. So he did not, outside the first day, he does not do it. How many, uh, well, I mean, there's a really, they didn't decide a lot. How many uh, horses 
did each trooper have to have to support this kind of a thing? They, they only start off, Stuart and some of the senior officers may have had several, but the average trooper only has one. They're appropriating mounts along the way from Union and from farmers along the way. But Stuart never, Stuart doesn't really ever give a report on how many, he simply reports, he doesn't report how many he abandons, he reports how many gains. Okay, so they didn't take any remounts with them, they sort of lived off the country. They lived off the country. Yeah. Okay. Well, that really takes, <laughs> that takes something out of the horse to try to ride as many hours as they were in the saddle. I grew up in the West, and the first day is an easy ride, a 22 mile ride. But you can, if you ride a horse and drive it hard for 40 miles, you have a good chance of breaking him down or her down. Because we used to have this guy, the wildest rider in the community I grew, grew up in. Uh, he ruined a horse by pushing him 40 miles in about six hours, about five hours, to ruin the horse. So they, their, their ride was uh, about how many miles? Did you? It's about 150 miles. 150 miles. Total. And they make the easy, the easy ones the first day, the 22 mile one. Then, then it's also relatively easy on the night of the, on the last day, on the, on the night of the 15th, 14th, 15th, and into the 16th. They finally rested a little bit. Stuart had great, Stuart himself apparently had tremendous energy because, for, for instance, at Gettysburg, when he gets at Gettysburg, everybody else is exhausted. And he immediately, uh, after they've had their confrontation, he and Lee, uh, Stuart then immediately proceeds out to Brinkerhoff Ridge and supervises the fighting over on Brinkerhoff Ridge without a much as buy or leave yourself. So Stuart evidently was one of these men that had tremendous energy. Slept in the saddle yeah. very well. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> when, where did Stuart's, the folks who followed him into town, where did they head back and when did they arrive in the area? The, 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 uh, the, the whole company? Yeah. The, the, they, he, he writes, he comes in yeah, by the morning of the 15th. Right. They're in by the evening of the 15th. And do they report back to the fairgrounds? They go back to the fairgrounds. Yes, sir. I heard somewhere that Mosby was the one who suggested the ride around to Stewart. Is that collaborated in any way? Well, I think Mosby also lives a long time. <laughs> <laughs> the secret is to live a long time. Because you, you can tell you can make yourself always more important as other people die off. I think because same way with Robbins, Robbins is everywhere. You can also rewrite your memoirs too if you live a long time. Yeah. Oh yeah. You can change your Sherman alters his quite a bit whenever somebody dies. <laughs> yes. What is the real significance now of having written around this? Uh, All right. What is the real significance? The significance is that it shows that confirms what Lee probably suspicion that McClellan's right flank is resting in the air. It is not anchored on the Alabama River, or it's not anchored on the Totopotomy, and it's not refused and entrenched. So that, so what he does now, Stuart gets back, show you the chain, Stuart gets back on the, Lee sees him on the morning of the 15th. On the 17th, Jackson is ordered. Jackson's divisions are camped at Mount Meridian in the valley. Jackson is ordered to bring his Two divisions to Richmond. Lee also at this time sends orders Whiting to take his division and proceed to Charlottesville to let McClellan think that Lee is reinforcing Jackson. He's already sent, he's already sent Lawton into the valley. So, so Lee, so Lee from this 
then sets into motion his plan that we'll be fighting tomorrow. Yes. Uh, Ed, is, is Stewart's cavalry used in any way to uh, to provide a vanguard for uh, for any of the infantry movements on during the seven days, like in front of uh, Jackson's movements? But on the on the twenty sixth. He is the Jackson, He is in front of Jackson, with certain of his units in front of Jackson. As Jackson, uh, Jackson, as we'll find out tomorrow, is not where he's supposed to be on the night of the 25th. Jackson says, "I'm going to start early. I'm going to be be, be crossed the railroad at Ashland by long before he is." Uh, Stewart is to is take uh, joins him and takes the lead. And as they do, uh, Stewart is the one that collides with Stoneman's cavalry up to about 10 o'clock, and when Stewart starts moving in, and then they start moving away. Uh, how much of Stewart's route is covered by modern roads? How much should it be? All right, you can, you can, it's a wonderful thing. You can follow the whole, you can follow the entire route by, not by bus. <laughs> Except for the stretch between at Tolliver's Mill. You can take that road, it goes into Tolliver's Mill till you run into a housing development. And then you can swing back out if you don't want to walk through the housing development and then go to Eon Church and then drive in there. And there's about a half a mile or a mile through there you can't follow. Then uh, if, you, if you're low water, there hasn't been any rain, you can follow his route from Tallyville to Providence Ford. But you cannot take a bus through there. Or you don't take it uh, because you've got to cross a Ford, and if it's range, you can't cross that Ford. It's south, it's south of Highway 60. Uh, so you can, it's a, a person, and while Hickory Hill Hickory Hill of 1862 does not stand. Some of the walls of it do because it burnt about in the 1880s and they built on the site of Hickory Hill. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the buildings are still there down at the fair, down at Gerlax. You can go down to Gerlax. So it's, it's a good one to follow because uh, it's, uh, the roads are still there and uh, and it has not been built over heavily. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I want to comment on uh, William Porter Alexander. Edward Porter Alexander mentioned that uh, he thought it would have been a whole lot better if it had been surreptitious to spies or what have you instead of Stuart, Stuart's raid or Stuart's circlement because he felt like that spooked McClellan and that caused McClellan to start preparations and cautions. Yes, it, it started, it didn't start McClellan for strengthening him his right, but McClellan, while he doesn't make the decision till the night of the 27th, McClellan had, was setting in his mind and had taken preliminary actions to shift his base from White House to Harrison's Lane. So it doesn't, it wasn't something that, suddenly struck him out uh, like a, like Zeus's thunderbolt on the night of the 27th to change his base. Now the other, other question associated, where was his flank? Was it hanging there at Beaver Dam Creek? Uh, his flank Kansas? is, uh, his flank is, no his flank, is, he doesn't get the guys up on Beaver Dam Creek until he brings McCall. They haven't really fortified their Beaver Dam. They have the Beaver Dam Creek position, but they have not as strong. When Stuart, when they attack at Beaver Dam Creek, they have McCall's division and Morrell Cool's divisions there. And at the time of the raid, uh, McC uh, McCall's division is at Tunsil Station. Well, there was no entrenched refused right flank. There's no, there's no refused right flank. And it doesn't stop 
McClellan doesn't halt the transfer of Franklin's Corps. He's in the process of transferring Franklin's Corps from the north to the south, and he does not halt it because of the raid. There's a lot of folks that recently been rather hard on Stuart, just as an opinion. Was there anybody to equal him in the East um, as a cavalry commander? John <laughs> Possibly Wade Hampton, because Hampton realizes when he comes to the command, well, Hampton has realized that the technological revolution in weaponry makes it better to use them, to make use them as mounted and dismounted infantry, which Stuart, I don't think, could ever brought himself to. One more question, please. Um, it seems to me one of the more complicated relationships is that between Lee and Stuart in the, in the uh, in terms of, you know, overall commander, support commander, the level of tolerance for flamboyant behavior. Do you have any insights on it? Was, was there sort of a father-son relationship, a black sheep? Well, I think uh, Lee had a high opinion of Stuart. Mm -hmm. I think he said, when he died, he says he never brought me any bad information. I think he had a high opinion of him, or he would not have giving him as much initiative freedom of action as he does. <laughs> I think I don't think he would have I don't think he would ever given Hampton or Bits Lee. Because he has to wrestle when Stuart gets killed, he has to wrestle for four weeks who he's gonna make command, Hampton or or Pitts. And then he's forced to do it when the Federals go on a Trevelyan raid. <laughs> 